بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين إن شاء الله continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم السيرة النبوية the prophetic biography in the last couple of sessions we've been talking about the second year of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم's residence in the city of Medina what we call the second year of Hijrah. This is the second year of the Prophet ﷺ settling in Medina and giving firm roots to the Muslim community in the city of Medina. So now this is the headquarters, this is the base of operations, this is where everything is happening from, everything is going on. Now in the course of this, what we talked about, we of course covered the first year, we're into the second year, about halfway, a little bit past the halfway mark of the second year in the city of Medina. There's been a couple of very, very important events. Namely, the first three what we call ghazawat, the first three prophetic campaigns have taken part here in the first part of the second year of Hijrah, where the Prophet ﷺ alongside you know, many of his companions, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, the sahaba, may Allah be pleased with them, they've traveled outside of Medina, and they've engaged with different groups and different tribes, and some of the Bedouin people that live around the vicinity and the area of the city of Medina. Now, in last week's uh, session, we talked about a very interesting event. And this is a very, very, very important event because it leads to what we know as one of the most landmark events in Islamic history, and that is the Battle of Badr. The great Battle of Badr, the great victory that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted to the believers, to the Muslims, at the place of Badr, the occasion of Badr. And that was the Sariya of Abdullah bin Jahash. Abdullah bin Jahash, who was a Qurayshi, who was a Muhajir, and a cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ had sent him out to kind of scout a certain region that was between Mecca and Ta'if, and to kind of keep an eye on that area. And of course, as we talked about last time, he ended up taking some extreme measures that the Prophet ﷺ had not given him license to do. And because of that, in the sacred months, a person from the Quraysh was killed, two men were captured, and then they were brought back to Medina by this group of Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ was of course very upset at this um, act, that these Sahaba took this action that was not sanctioned by the Prophet ﷺ. Nevertheless, what happened as a response to that was, the propaganda machine started to churn in Mecca. And the Meccans and the Quraysh basically used this as an opportunity to launch a whole um, propaganda and a whole campaign against the Muslims that look, nothing is sacred to Muhammad. Nothing is sacred to these Muslims. They will violate everything sanctified, everything that is sacred in our lives. If we let these people have their way. Look, they killed a person in the sacred months. They did this. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course issued the response divinely that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say yes, uh, revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, Yes, alunaka ani shahri al harami qitalin fihi. Qul qitalun fihi kabir. Wa saddun an sabilillahi wa kufrun bihi wal masjid al haram wa ikhraju ahli minhu akbaru inda Allah. That they ask you about fighting in the sacred months, tell them that is bad, that is wrong, that is not allowed. However, what's even worse than that is persecuting people, extracting people from their homes, kicking them out from their lands, from their homes, not allowing people the freedom of religion and to be able to practice the whatever way of life they choose for themselves. This is a greater evil in the eyes of God. Well, fitna to akbaru min al-qatil, and causing this type of societal causing this type of chaos in society is a greater harm than an isolated incident where one person died and that is being remedied and taken care of. That is being handled properly. But what you people have done is you've created chaos across the board in society. You've thrown everything. You've turned everything upside down. That's a lot worse. So think about what you're doing. And what, the reason why I kind of bring this up again is that I didn't get a chance to talk about this last time. Abdullah bin Jahash radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you know the Arabs were very eloquent people. And they were, they were masters of this language. And Abdullah bin Jahash, you know, coming from a Qurayshi background, coming from Mecca, where they had a huge culture. 
And it was a huge part of their cultural heritage uh, to engage in poetry and to recite poetry. Abdullah bin Jahash actually recited some poetry at this occasion. He says, تَعُدُّونَ قَتْلًا فِي الْحَرَامِ عَظِيمَةُ وَأَعْظَمُ مِنْهُ لَوْ يَرَى الرُّشْدَ رَاشِدُ سُدُودُكُمْ عَمَّا يَقُولُ مُحَمَّدُ وَكُفْرٌ بِهِ وَاللَّهِ رَائِنْ وَشَاهِدُ وَإِخْرَاجُكُمْ مِنْ مَسْجِدِ اللَّهِ أَهْلَهُ لِأَلَّا يُرَى لِلَّهِ فِي الْبَيْتِ سَاجِدُ فَإِنَّا وَإِنْ عَيَّرْتُمُونَا بِقَتْلِهِ وَأَرْجَفَ بِالْإِسْلَامِ بَاغٍ وَحَاسِدُ سَقَيْنَا مِنْ إِبْنِ الْحَضْرَمِ الرُّمَاحُنَا بِنَخْلَةَ لَمَّا أَوْقَدَ الْحَرْبُ وَاقِدُ دَمًا وَإِبْنُ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ عُثْمَانِ بَيْنَنَا يُنَازِعُهُ غُلٌّ مِنَ الْقَدِّ عَانِدُ So he basically says that you are saying that we, a murder occurred in the sacred months and that's a big deal. But what's greater than that is what you've done, but you need intelligence and guidance to be able to see the light. You don't see the light. You don't see things for what they are. You have been preventing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa from his message. You've disbelieved in Muhammad. While Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been watching all of this and Allah is a witness against you. You've kicked out the people from the haram who are rightful residents of that land. لِأَلَّا يُرَى لِلَّهِ فِي الْبَيْتِ سَاجِدُ To the point now where if you go to the Kaaba, you go to Mecca, you go to the Haram today, you don't see a single person sincerely doing sajda before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah deserves. As that place of God, that house of God deserves. So you people, even though you may be blaming us for a murder we committed, admittedly, and we are regretful for this, but you have declared war against Islam out of nothing but hatred and jealousy. Yes, we shed blood of Ibn al-Hadrami, but we have offered reparations for that. And the diya, the blood money was given to the family of Ibn al-Hadrami, the Makkan that was killed. But he says that, but Abdullah uh, ibn, uh, Abd- Uthman ibn Abdullah, who was one of the captives, he says he is still alive and safe and amongst us, and we will release him back to his family and to his people. So he p- puts everything into perspective, and I just thought it was very beautiful how he kind of puts that into perspective. Now going forward, after the incident of Abdullah bin Jahash, we are now in the month of Rajab. The month of Rajab, then obviously it's the month of Sha'ban, and then the month of Ramadan. The battle of Badr occurs in the month of Ramadan. And we'll be talking about it as we proceed through the calendar, the chronology of the seerah. Right now we're in the month of Rajab. Now there's a little bit of a difference of opinion. The next major event that takes place is called Tahwilul Qibla. The turning of the direction of the prayer. That is the next major event in Islamic history. That occurs in the second year of Hijrah, the second year of the Prophet Wasallam's residence in the city of Medina. There's a difference of opinion amongst the historians and amongst the scholars of Sirah, whether the turning of the Qibla occurred in the month of Rajab, or it occurred in the month of Sha'ban. There's a little bit of a difference of opinion. Many of the scholars of Sirah who came a little bit later, obviously the earlier scholars of Sirah are folks like Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, Al-Waqidi, Al-Bayhaqi, so on and so forth. Ibn Kathir rahimahullahu ta'ala, who is again another authoritative scholar of, of history and the seerah, but he comes a little bit afterwards. And that's why he a lot of times will filter through a lot of their narrations and you know, confirm and uh, reaffirm and kind of reconcile some of the different narrations. Ibn Kathir rahimahullahu ta'ala's assessment is that the fact that it occurred in the month of Sha'ban is a little bit more authoritative. There's more evidence pointing to the fact that it occurred in the month of Sha'ban. The evidence that points to the fact that it occurred in the month of Rajab is there are some narrations where some of the Sahaba say that the Qibla changed, the Qibla turned in 16 or 17 months after the Prophet ﷺ arrival in the city of Medina. And when you when you estimate, when you calculate 16, 17 months, you land basically in the month of Rajab. But Ibn Kathir says, they're basically guesstimating. They're kind of averaging it out. It was something like, like we would say it was a few months. Or it was a dozen or so months. It was about a year and a half. 
When I say it was about a year and a half, it could have been 15 months, it could have been 18 months, it could have been 17 months, it could have been 16 months, it could have been a number of different time frames. But I say it was about kind of like a year and a half. He's saying that that's what they're referring to. So it's not really authoritative. But there are specific narrations which say the month of Sha'ban, and that's basically what we will defer to as well, that the Qibla changed in the month of Sha'ban. Al-Waqidi, who is another historian and a scholar of the seerah, he is a source of the seerah, he has a very interesting narration that is not very strong and authentic, but he pinpoints the exact day. He says that it occurred in the middle of the month of Sha'ban on a, on a Tuesday. He gets that specific. It occurred on a Tuesday in the middle of the month of Sha'ban, but Ibn Kathir says that's stretching it. He says that making it that specific is not correct, it's not authentic. Nevertheless, in the middle of the month of Sha'ban, what occurs? So the Qibla up till this point, now let's think about, since when has the Prophet ﷺ been praying? This is something we've talked about at length here in our study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ in the seerah. We've talked about this at length. We know that the five times daily prayer became mandated when? What's the incident called everybody? Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, very good. Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, the journey by night to Jerusalem and the ascension above the heavens. That is when the five times daily prayer became obligated. As we know it today, Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. Alright? But the Prophet ﷺ was praying since the very first day of revelation. Jibreel alayhi salam came and taught the Prophet ﷺ wudu, and then taught him salah, and he started praying from the very first day. When did he used to pray? How much did he used to pray? We don't have a lot of details. One thing we know is that the Prophet ﷺ used to pray throughout the day. And he especially would pray whenever he felt the need to pray. Whenever he ran into some situation, he felt overwhelmed by his mission, by his cause, by the circumstances, he would pray. Secondly, the Qur'an also tells us, Makkan revelation that is pre Isra wal Mi'raj tells us that the Prophet ﷺ used to specifically pray by the command of Allah, by the verses of the Qur'an, he used to pray in the morning and in the evening. Kind of like Fajr and Asr. That the qabla tulu'i shamsi wa qabla ghurubiha. Like we see in Surah Taha and many other surahs of the Qur'an that are Makkan. Early Makkan, mid Makkan. So they used to pray at least twice a day. And then of course we know through Surah Al-Muzammil that there was a third prayer the Prophet ﷺ consistently observed throughout the early Meccan period and throughout his mission. And that was the tahajjud, the qiyamul layl, the night prayer. So three times a day he used to pray for sure. The night prayer, what we call fajr prayer, and what we call asr prayer. And then aside from that the Prophet ﷺ would, as we say, Offer two raka'at whenever he felt the need. إِذَا حَزَبَهُ أَمْرٌ فَزَعَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ Alright, and he taught his wife to pray, and he taught his nephew Ali to pray, and he taught all the believers as soon as they would accept Islam, he would teach them to pray. In fact, they used to pray together in the house of Arqam, Darul Arqam, in the days of Mecca. So keep in mind, the Prophet ﷺ has been praying since the beginning of the mission. What was the Qibla? So the Qibla from the very first day, the direction of the prayer from the very first day was Baytul Maqdis in Jerusalem. Al Masjidul Aqsa, Baytul Maqdis in Jerusalem. Alright, the sacred house of God that is in Jerusalem. The Prophet ﷺ used to pray in that direction. And that also happened to be the direction in which the Ahlul Kitab, like the Jews, they used to pray in that direction as well. So the Prophet ﷺ observed that prayer. At the same time though, we do have authentic narrations in the words of the Prophet ﷺ, which lead us to know that Ibrahim ﷺ used to pray towards the Kaaba, the Baytullah in Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ had a longing because he was a descendant of Ibrahim ﷺ. He was reviving the Milla of Ibrahim. He was at the city and the place that was founded by Ibrahim. The Prophet ﷺ had this longing. He was a response of the dua of Ibrahim. Alright, so he had this longing to pray in the direction of Ibrahim. And that was Kaaba Baytullah al Masjid al Haram in Mecca. Now, while the Prophet ﷺ resided in Mecca, there was no problem. It was very simple, it was very easy. The solution was right there in front of him, literally. And that was the Prophet ﷺ used to stand in front of the Kaaba while still being aligned with Baytul Maqdis. 
Because he has the Kaaba right there, right? He can stand on any side of the Kaaba and pray. So he used to pray on the side of the Kaaba where he would be aligned facing both the Kaaba and through the Kaaba he'd be also facing al Baytul Maqdis, Masjid Aqsa. And it was a very simple solution. And that's how the Prophet ﷺ observed prayer throughout the Makkan period and during his time in Makkatul Mukarramah. After Hijrah and after migration though, the Prophet ﷺ was now faced with a dilemma. He was faced with a dilemma. And that was Medina was between Mecca and between Jerusalem. So now the Prophet ﷺ could not pray both, towards both Mecca and Jerusalem. Kaaba and Baytul Maqdis. He couldn't pray towards both. And in fact, the real troubling thing to the Prophet ﷺ, the difficult thing for him, was that when he would pray towards Baytul Maqdis, his back would be towards the Kaaba. So it wasn't like even just the same general direction. No, no, it was the complete opposite. But this is what tells you, this is what shows you the obedience of the Prophet ﷺ. And the example that he gave for us in terms of obedience to Allah, that the Prophet ﷺ obeyed the command of Allah in spite of his inclination and his emotions and his emotional, spiritual attachment to the Kaaba, he prayed towards Baytul Maqdis, even if that necessitated putting his back towards the Kaaba. He did what Allah told him to do. But the ahadith mentioned, there are narrations in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, and even in the Sahihain, in Bukhari and Muslim. There are narrations which tell us that the Prophet ﷺ continued to make dua and ask Allah to grant him permission to be able to pray towards the Kaaba in Mecca. He kept making dua. And the Prophet ﷺ was very hopeful. We kind of learn a little bit about the etiquette of du'a. You know how hopeful the Prophet ﷺ was that his du'a would be accepted sooner or later? It would be accepted. There's an incident, again we've already talked about this, if you recall, that when some of the early people, the early Muslims from Medina, the Bay'atul Aqaba Athaniya, the second time that the Muslims from Medina took bay'ah, gave the oath of allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ, when that incident took place, there was an elder of the people of Medina, an elder of Yathrib, an elder of Medina, a leader of their tribe, very elderly man, like almost to the point where he was kind of like, you know, like a really old person, somewhat senile even, right? And so he was traveling to Mecca from Medina, Right? And there was a whole group of Muslims traveling, like 60, 70 something Muslims were traveling. And on the way there, whenever time for Salah would come, because the Salah al Mi'raj has already happened, and Musa bin Umair has been teaching them how to pray. So they used to pray. So while they were traveling, they would stop and they would offer Salah. And they were taught, they were told, especially because they lived in Medina, they were trained, you pray towards Bayt al-Maqdis. Praying towards Mecca, praying towards the Kaaba was not even an option that was on the table. So when they would stop and they would pray, this old man says, no, I ain't gonna pray in that direction. I ain't gonna do it. I'm gonna pray towards the Kaaba in Mecca. I just, I just know it in my heart. I'm gonna do this. And the reason why I mentioned specifically he was a very elderly man, because people tried to kind of explain to him, like, Ammu, uncle, come on, please, we gotta everybody turn just a little bit, join everybody in Salah, Bismillah, and he said, no, leave me alone. Don't tell me what to do. Right? And that was it. That was the end of that. And he's like, I'm gonna, and he's praying in a complete opposite direction from the rest of the jama'ah. He's like, I don't care what you people are doing, I'm gonna pray in this direction. Then they get to Mecca. Now when they get to Mecca, he says, he narrates it himself, the elderly man. He says, I, I felt kind of guilty. I felt kind of bad. And he got to meet the Prophet ﷺ before all the other Muslims of Medina got to meet the Prophet ﷺ because he was such an elder leader of his tribe that he was friends with Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. So he goes and meets Abbas and he says, why don't you make introductions between me and your nephew? So he got kind of an in, Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ comes, and of course the Prophet ﷺ is like, Ahlan wa sahlan, marhabam. Right, this is his am, this is his uncle. And then he says, well, I wanted to introduce you to this elder of his people, Fulan ibn Fulan. And then he sits down and he basically says, Ya Rasulullah, I'm a Muslim, I'm a believer. I got a little bit of a question. I got a little bit of a question. This is what I did. I prayed in the other direction. The Prophet ﷺ told him, look, the command of Allah right now is that you pray towards Baytul Maqdis. And of course, being Muhammad Rasulullah, the man said, Sami'ana, 
وَأَطَعْنَا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا Right? But then the Prophet ﷺ told him something very interesting. He said, لَوْ صَبَرْتَ لَأَصَبْتَ لَوْ صَبَرْتَ لَأَصَبْتَ he said, What he told him was, if you would have kept praying towards the Kaaba without bringing it up to me, see now that you tell me, I gotta tell you, you know you gotta pray towards Baytul Maqdis. But if you would have kept praying towards the Kaaba without talking to me, eventually you would have been correct. Wink, wink. Right? Subhanallah, look at the yaqeen of the Prophet ﷺ and his dua. And this is like four years before the, this is like three, almost four years before the Qibla turned. But he already knew that my Allah will accept my dua. And we will pray towards the Kaaba. We will pray towards the Kaaba, my brother. And so subhanallah, that, that just, this, the, all the different pieces are now connecting. All the different pieces are now connecting. So now the Prophet ﷺ is residing in the city of Medina. He's praying towards Baytul Maqdis. He keeps making his dua. And in the middle of the month of Sha'ban, the Prophet ﷺ finishes praying Salatul Dhuhr. And after Salatul Dhuhr, the Prophet ﷺ sometimes would take a little break. But sometimes when the need was there, the Prophet ﷺ would remain in the masjid and handle any type of community affairs. Like things that needed to be done. The to-do list, the Prophet ﷺ would kind of, if anything was remaining on the to-do list for the community, the Prophet ﷺ would check off those remaining items after Dhuhr. So he's kind of taking care of things and Jibreel ﷺ comes to the Prophet ﷺ. And he says, and he brings him the ayat from Surah Al-Baqarah. قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ قَدْ نَرَى We have seen تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ Your face turning up to the sky in anticipation of this hukum coming. فَلَنُوَلِّيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا SubhanAllah. The, the, the way Allah talks about it is so unbelievable. Before Allah even names the qibla, He says that we will without a doubt turn you in the direction that will please you, Ya Muhammad. The first name given to the qibla before Allah talked about what it is, He it said it's the qibla that will please you. Ya Habib. فَلَنُوَلِّ يَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا And then Allah says, فَوَلِّ وَجْهَكَ شَطَرَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ Now Ya, O oh Beloved, now turn your face in the direction of Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Al-Ka'batu Al-Sharifa, Baytu Allah Al-Haram, Fi Makkah Al-Mukarrama. Now turn your direction in the, face in the direction of the, of the Kaaba, and that is your Qibla, and that is the direction that you will pray in now. And so when the Prophet ﷺ prayed Salatul Asr, he prayed it in the... So the narration says that when this ayah, when this came down, when this whole revelation, there's a whole passage, inshallah I'm gonna go through it and we'll talk about some of the, some of the benefits and the hikam and the lessons, the take home lessons that we get from this. But when this was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ basically had told Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu to gather the people. Gather the people. And everyone was gathered in the masjid, and the Prophet ﷺ issued the command. We will pray now in the direction of Mecca, Al-Ka'batu Sharifa, Baytullah Al-Haram, Fi Mecca Al-Mukarramah. We are going to pray in that direction now. Bismillah. And they prayed to Asr in that direction. Now the Prophet ﷺ, you know, he informs them, and by this time, there are some, there are some satellite musallas. Satellite prayer places that have been established in certain areas. One of the first ones that was established, of course we know is a masjid in Quba. That was a full-fledged masjid, of course not in the sense it was in a jami'ah. They didn't pray Jumu'ah there. They didn't pray Jumu'ah there, but they used to pray there five times a day. The other place where they used to pray a couple of prayers a day, as needed, was the masjid of Banu Salima. And that was closest Right, that was literally like another area, another neighborhood of Medina. So as they started to pray Asr, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ goes out to the people of Banu Salima to inform them. The problem is that by the time he reaches the place of Banu Salima, they've already started Asr prayer. They've already started praying Asr. So the narration says that the messenger, he basically walks in and he proclaims. He sees them all praying in the, in the opposite direction. And so he walks in and he claims, he says, Ashhadu billah. Ashhadu billah. I bear witness before God 
لَقَدْ صَلَّيْتُ مَعَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ قِبْلَ مَكَّةِ I prayed with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in the direction of Mecca. So that implies that he prayed Asr with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and then he went out there and he caught them still praying Asr. So he said that I prayed with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in the direction of Mecca. فَدَارُوا كَمَا هُمْ قِبْلَ الْبَيْتِ فَدَارُوا هُمْ قِبْلَ الْبَيْتِ So they turned as they were in the direction of, they completely turned around. And one of the narrations specifically says, a narration brought by Imam Ahmad, specifically says that they were in Ruku'ah. And they all turned around in Ruku'ah. And how does that exactly work? So everybody, wherever they were sitting, they just turned around, 180. And the Imam basically walked all the way around to the other side and stood in front of them. And that is a permissible act. And from that we actually even extrapolate from our fiqh, that if you find somebody praying towards the wrong direction, you can actually go and physically turn that person. Or if you are praying in the wrong direction, and somebody comes and says, hey, you're praying in the wrong direction. And you understand and realize that you are praying in the wrong direction, you can actually turn within your prayer. We extrapolate from that. So they all turned within their prayer, and started praying in the right direction. And that incident, the masjid of Banu Salima, is basically the masjid that we know today, and the masjid that many times people visit when they go to Medina today as Masjid Qiblatain. If you ever go for Umrah, Hajj, and you go to the uh, Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, you go to visit the city of Medina, and you go and you see the masjid called Masjid Qiblatain, right? That's the masjid where this incident took place. But that wasn't the only incident. Quba was a little bit outside of Medina. And basically, since this happened at Asr time, Right? And because at that point in time in the calendar, it's very possible that the month of Sha'aban might have been more toward the winter months, that there, shortly after Asr, Maghrib time came right in. There wasn't a lot of time. And once it got dark, typically, people would not travel. People wouldn't go out too far. So nobody got out to Quba till the following morning. Nobody got out to Quba till the following morning. But while the people of Quba were praying Salatul Fajr, some narrations basically say that while they were praying Salatul Fajr, and especially because they used to implement the advice of the Prophet ﷺ, asfiru bil Fajr, فَإِنَّهُ أَعْضَمُ لِلْأَجْرِ They used to pray their Fajr a little bit later, right? Like if you split Fajr time into two parts, they would pray at the beginning of the half of the Fajr time, right? So if Fajr time kicks in at 6 a.m. and Fajr time expires at like, we'll say 7 a.m. just round to work with the round numbers, it's easier. Then they would pray Fajr time like at 6.30. So because, you know, it starts to brighten up a little bit and that's the meaning of Isfar, somebody was able to reach out there. And they basically walked in on them praying in towards the Baytul Maqdis, Jerusalem. And again, the announcement was made and they again turned in the middle of their prayer. And they started praying towards the Kaaba. And now officially the Qibla, the Kaaba had completely turned and changed. Now, for our benefit, what I'd like to do is... For our benefit, what I'd like to do is kind of go through that passage that is there in the beginning of the second juz, which is in the middle of Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically talks about the turning and the changing of the Qibla. And this is smack dab in the middle of Surah Al-Baqarah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta, uh, revealed the ayat, سَيَقُولُ السُّفَهَاءُ مِنَ النَّاسِ مَا وَلَّاهُمْ عَنْ قِبْلَتِهِمُ الَّتِي كَانُوا عَلَيْهَا That very soon foolish people, f- f- foolish people from amongst the people, they will say that what turned them away from their qibla that they used to be upon. قُلْ لِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ Tell them that to, to Allah alone belongs the east and the west. يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَىٰ صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمٍ And just today, you know, we were, uh, uh, we were reading in the, the tafsir of Ibn Ashur. He actually talks about this in Surah Al-Ahzab, that when you mention the two parts or the two portions of something, you basically are implying that everything in between also falls under the same hukum. 
It's from usul that if like if you say al-dhahru wal-batanu, al-mashiqu wal-maghribu, right? That if you say that the east and the west, right, are such and such, then everything in between them also falls under the same hukum, falls under the same ruling. All right, so قُلْ لِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبُ The far east is for Allah, the far west is for Allah, which means what? Everything in between is for Allah. All right? يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ And Allah, He guides whomsoever He wills to the straight path. Which means what? That praying towards the new qibla is a straight path, and if you haven't realized that, that just means that God hasn't guided you. So it's taking a little jab back at them. You know, this is basically what we talk about. That sometimes you don't have to respond to all the haters. Let Allah respond on your behalf. Don't respond to the haters sometimes. People talk, that's what they do. Qila wa qal, they call it in Arabic. People do what they gotta do. But you do what you gotta do. And don't worry about responding to every single person. You know, this is gonna be a bit of a tangent, may Allah forgive me, but we were reading in the tafsir of Surah Al-Ahzab today. If you read Surah Al-Ahzab, you know what's fascinating? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the very difficult situation scenario. And we're gonna come across this in the seerah, so I'm gonna skip over a lot of the details. But Allah talks about the very difficult situation from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, where the Prophet ﷺ proposes marriage between Zayd bin Haritha, his adopted son, quote unquote, and Zainab bin Tijahash, who was his cousin. Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anhu's family is not so comfortable with the proposal. Allah reveals the ayah, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنْ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَا إِذَا قَضَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُنَ لَهُمُ الْخِيرًا مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ That if God and His Messenger decrees something, then it's not befitting for a believer, man or woman, to basically have any choice left in the, in the situation. You got do what they tell you, سَمِعْنَا وَطَعْنَا So they went ahead and they got married. Things didn't work out, they weren't very compatible. And this occurred divinely in the life of the Prophet ﷺ so that we'd have a precedent for the fact that sometimes people are meant to be, sometimes things don't work out. It's regrettable, it's, you know, it's not ideal, but it happens. So they, things aren't working out. The Prophet ﷺ is kind of counseling them and trying to emphasize to Zayd, أَمْسِكْ عَلَيْكَ زَوْجَكَ وَاتَّقِ اللَّهِ Come on, be conscious of Allah. Maybe you got some things you can work on, but come on, try to work this out. Eventually things don't work out. And they do separate and they do get divorced. And in some narrations it talks about a couple of years later, after they separate, some narrations say a few months later, after they get separated, they get divorced. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we have already married you. He didn't command the Prophet ﷺ to marry Zainab. He said, we have already married you to Zainab. Because that's best for everyone. Plus it's setting, the, it's setting the record straight in regards to calling somebody your son. Doesn't actually make them your son. And there's a lot of interesting detail in this that basically settles any type of misconceptions anyone could have about this situation. Because you have to read history. You have to read history, right? And so when you read the whole historical account, it leaves actually, you're not uncomfortable with the situation at all. Nevertheless, now the Prophet says, marry Zainab. But of course, the munafiqoon do what? Party time. For the munafiqoon, for the critics, for the Quraysh, for the Jews, party time. Right? They have something that they can basically, again, use for false rumors. They start, start fima farad Allahu lah. Right? That this that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decreed, they just went to town with this. They they started spreading all these false rumors. You know what's really fascinating? After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this whole scenario, you know what the next ayah is? Ya ladina Allah said, Don't respond. Think about it. These people are spreading malicious rumors about the Prophet. And Allah tells the believers, make dhikr. Make lots and lots of dhikr. Oh, that's not enough. وَسَبِّحُوهُ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا And then do tasbih and pray and make even more elaborate dhikr of Allah in the morning and in the evening. And everything. And that's why Allah says, بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا In the morning make dhikr, in the evening make dhikr, which means what? All day long make dhikr, dhikr, dhikr. 
The only time you shouldn't be making dhikr is when you're asleep. So if you're not sleeping, make dhikr. And specifically the Mufassirun mentioned that what Allah was emphasizing here was what? Don't respond to these people. Don't engage the, the, the haters. Right? I always remember this, just this little, th- I don't know, this nugget, I don't know what else to call it, like this, this little idea that, you know, uh, I used to hear like, elder, our elders used to kind of tell us, right? They said that, they would always say that if you're walking by, you know, if you're, especially like in a residential neighborhood, if you're walking by and somebody's got a kind of like a really feisty dog in their backyard, the second you walk by, what does the dog do? He goes crazy. He jumps up, starts ramming the fence, starts barking his head off. What do you do? Do you sit there and start to bark back? Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Right? You don't. So just like you don't bark back at the dog, but you understand that you are of a higher standard and status, you're a human being. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. Right? So you keep on walking. You keep on walking. Right? Same way here. So going back to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, don't respond to these haters. مَا وَاللَّهُمْ عَنْ قِبْلَتِهِمُ الَّتِي كَانُوا عَلَيْهَا قُلْ لِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبُ We worship Allah, everything belongs to Allah brother. Yeah, and then Allah takes a shot. يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ so if you don't get this, that means you obviously aren't on Siratul Mustaqim, which means God didn't guide you. I feel bad for you. All right. Then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa kadalika jaalnakum ummatan wasata." We have made you the best of people. That's why we've given you the best qibla. Li takunu shuhada ala nasi wa yakun al rasulu alaykum shayda. So you may be a witness upon people, and the messenger may be a witness upon you. And that's also part of the distinction of the ummah. All the other ummah prayed towards one qibla or another. This ummah Muhammadiyah prayed towards both qiblas. This ummah Muhammadiyah is the unifying ummah because it prayed towards both qiblas. وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الْقِبْلَةَ الَّتِي كُنْتَ عَلَيْهَا إِلَّا لِنَعْلَمَ مَنْ يَتَّبِعُ الرَّسُولِ مِمَّنْ يَنْقَلِبُ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ And Allah says that we did not turn and change your qibla except to be able to know who will follow the messenger and from those people who will fall back. Who will not follow the messenger, they will default. وَإِنْ كَانَتْ لَكَبِيرَةً إِلَّا عَلَىٰ الَّذِينَ هَدَ اللَّهِ And this is gonna be really tough to swallow. This is gonna be a very bitter pill to swallow, except for those people whom Allah has guided. And then Allah responds to a question. Some of the believers now come to the Prophet ﷺ, and they say, what happens to the prayers that we've already prayed towards the old Qibla? What happens to the people who died and they used to pray towards the old Qibla? Are they not amongst ummatan wasata? Are they not at the same level as all of us now that we have prayed towards both qiblas? So Allah responds, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِيمَانَكُمْ Allah will not waste your iman. Allah will not waste your iman. Allah will not waste your faith. What Allah is referring to, the question was, what's gonna happen to our prayer? Salawat. And Allah said, Allah will not waste your iman. Allah substituted the word salah with iman. لَا إِيمَانَ لِمَنْ لَا صَلَاةَ لَهُ because there is no iman if you don't, if you ain't got salah. No salah, no iman. Very, very powerful. Very powerful. What that means is, the Prophet ﷺ said that, the distinguishing, الفرق بين الإيمان والكفر الصلاة The differentiating, the demarcating line between iman and kufr is salah. The thing that protects your iman is your salah. The thing that keeps you on the right side of that balance is salah. Maintain your prayer. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِالنَّاسِ لَرَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ فَلَنُوَلِّيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا فَوَلِّي وَجْهَكَ شَطْرَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ فَوَلُّوا وَجْهُكُمْ شَطْرَةً Wherever you go from here on today, wherever you go, travel in God's green earth, always face towards the Kaaba and pray towards the Kaaba. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ لَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ And these people who have been given the book, these Jewish neighbors of yours, they know that this is the right way, they know that this is God's way, they know that this was instruction was given to you by Allah Himself. And Allah is keeping full tabs of everything that these people are doing. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to talk to the Prophet. 
وَلَئِنْ أَتَيْتَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ بِكُلِّ آيَةٍ مَا تَبِعُوا قِبْلَتَكَ If you went to these people with every single sign, every single possible form of proof, they would not follow your qibla. وَمَا أَنْتَ بِتَابِعٍ قِبْلَتَهُمْ And you of course are not going to default back to the old qibla. وَلَيْنِ اتَّبَعْتَ أَهْوَاهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِنَّكَ إِذَا لَمِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ If you go back to joining them after guidance has come to you from your Lord, knowledge has come to you from Allah, then you will have been amongst the wrongdoing people. You will have made a serious mistake. And then basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues on from there. So these are the ayat that basically served as the turning point of where this qibla changed. Now, what I want to talk about last here is a couple of take-home lessons from this whole incident of the turning and the changing of the qibla that are really worthwhile, that are things that we should really reflect upon. Number one, the turning of the qibla wasn't just some random thing. Yes, one of the things I forgot to mention, a factual thing that is very important for the student of knowledge to know, there were ayat that were revealed before this, shortly before this. مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِيَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا وَمِثْرِهَا This is called مَسْأَلَةُ النَّسَخْ The fact that Allah abrogates, Allah changes a command. The previous command expires and the new command kicks in. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed the ayat already that said, never do we abrogate. Do we update the previous ruling except that we updated it with something that was equal or even better. So meaning Allah had already planted the seed to let the believers know and be comfortable with the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is very possible and plausible that Allah will update a previous command. He told you to pray towards Baytul Maqdis and now He's updating that pray towards the Kaaba. The first nasakh that took place in the history of Islam was the turning of the Qibla. Was the turning of the Qibla. And probably the most profound and the most powerful of all the uh, elements of nasakh that took place was the turning of the Qibla. One that we live out every single day. Alright? So that's one thing. Now, the turning of the Qibla wasn't just some random thing. Just wake up one morning, Let's just turn the Qibla. It wasn't like that. It was very extremely strategic and it had a lot of wisdom behind it. First thing, when the Muslims lived in Mecca, who were their neighbors? Their non-Muslim neighbors that they lived amongst in Mecca, who were they? The Mushrikun. The Mushrikun of Mecca. What, where did the mushrikun of Mecca worship at? What was the direction of their worship? The Kaaba. The Kaaba was their direction of worship. Wrongly, but that's where they worshipped. And that was the direction and the focus of their worship was the Kaaba. So while the Muslims were in Mecca, Allah commanded them to pray towards Baytul Maqdis. So that what? So that they would be different. Unique, at least in their worship. They would have a unique spiritual identity. When they come to Medina, to not rock the boat initially, they're also praying towards Baytul Maqdis, establishing general ties with the Jewish community. So they have some common ground to build off of. But once the Muslim community has been established in Medina, then now who, who are their non-Muslim neighbors in Medina? The Jews. They pray towards Baytul Maqdis. Now Allah turns their direction of prayer towards, towards the Kaaba in Mecca. To differentiate. From this we take a lesson. Our Usuliyun Shawaliullah Muhaddith Adelawi, he talks about this as a philosopher and as a scholar of Aqidah. He actually talks about this. That from this one, the things that we learn is that the unique spiritual identity of the Muslims is very necessary. There are a lot of things where we join hands and we work with and we have common causes and common platforms and common ground with non-Muslim communities that we coexist with. But we need to have a unique spiritual identity. And the thing that gives us our unique spiritual identity is our salah. Is our salah. When we go outside, you're driving and all of a sudden it's time for salah, we're the ones who stop by the side of the road and pray. When you're at the mall or the shopping center, we're the ones who pull off to a corner and pray. 
when we're traveling or you're, you know, we're the ones who go and find the chapel or find a corner in the airport and pray. Unique spiritual identity. It's a very powerful thing. The second lesson that we take from this tahwil al-qibla, that's very profound and very important, very necessary for us, is that politically speaking, it was a very powerful statement. So now two years after there's been some level of confrontation between the Meccans and the Muslims, the Quraysh and the Muslims, there's been some confrontation, not all out fighting and war yet, there's been no battle. But there's been some engagement, some confrontation, some back and forth. The Muslims turn their direction of prayer towards Mecca and start praying towards Mecca. Think about the message that that sent. The message that was sending to the people in Mecca. That this Kaaba is so sacred to these Muslims that they pray in this direction. How long before they come to claim it? How long before they come to claim it? That's why the scholars of Sirah and the scholars of Tafsir they basically say that this was actually the first ishara. This was the first divine ishara. This was the first divine gesture and foretelling of Fath Makkah, of the conquest of Makkah. That all Muslims, this place is so sacred that you've been told to pray it. You're gonna go reclaim it sooner or later. And similarly, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow the ummah to also reclaim Baytul Maqdis insha'Allah. Right? And so, this is basically another profound lesson that we take from this tahwil al-qibla and the turning of the qibla. And I'll finally end with a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that's mentioned by Imam Ahmad in his musnad. It's an authentic narration narrated by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ يَعْنِي فِي أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ The Prophet ﷺ says about the Ahlul Kitab, إِنَّهُمْ لَمْ, إنهم لم يَحْسُدُونَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ كَمَا يَحْسُدُونَ That they do not envy us for anything as much as they envy us for the following three things. They, they are number one, عَلَى يَوْمِ الْجُمُعَةِ on the day of Friday. الَّتِي هَدَانَ اللَّهُ لَهَا وَضَلُّوا عَنْهَا That's Jumu'ah, is something Allah gave us but didn't give to them. Number two, وَعَلَى الْقِبْلَةِ الَّتِي هَدَانَ اللَّهُ لَهَا وَضَلُّوا عَنْهَا The Qibla that Allah gave us, the Kaaba, that He did not give them. وَعَلَى قَوْلِنَا خَلْفَ الْإِمَامِ آمين. And how we say Ameen when we pray behind the Imam. That is a gift that Allah gave us and not them. All right? Ala hasbil ikhtilaf bil jahar sirran. We'll leave that for another day, inshallah. All right. So, inshallah, that's basically the conclusion for today's session. So, we talked about tahwil al qibla and all the profound lessons from it. Inshallah, you know, uh, at least for the attendees that are here, anybody who's watching online, and maybe anybody who's listening, inshallah, later on, we're about to pray Salat al Isha now. When we stand up to pray Salat al Isha, or you stand up to pray your sunnah, or whatever it may be. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this gift of granting us this ability, this gift, this honor, this distinction, and this unique spiritual identity that we pray, we offer salah towards the Kaaba, the Baytullah, the answer of the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahum wa bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfirka wa natubu ilayk.